Today from the Global Lane, child rape in Pakistan. This time a toddler is the victim and Christians get rare justice. Singapore summit, what's next? Peace, prayer and prosperity? And if Trump walked on water, who would say he couldn't swim? Coming to America this fall, blue wave or red wave? And I'll drive it home. There's more outrage from the U.S. entertainment industry. And it's all right here, right now, from the Global Lane. In Pakistan, Christians are often treated as second and third class citizens. They're a tiny minority of only 2%. And most recently, a little Christian girl was raped by a Muslim. But there was rare justice in this case. Here to explain is Wilson Chowdhury. He's a British Pakistani Christian. Wilson, uh, this is a horrible case. It's one that's very hard for us to report. So tell us about little Saiba. I guess she's three now, but it was only two when this crime against her occurred back in December 2016. Uh, so what indeed, happened? Indeed. Uh, in December 2016, she would have been around, coming up to two and a half years old. Um, now, the poor child was left at home with her older brother, who was 10 years old. Um, because the mother and her eldest son had to go to work to, to feed the family. Um, whilst the, 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 the adults in the family were out of the home, um, a close friend of the Christian man, uh, the, the, the son of, the, the brother of, of Sabre, the eldest brother, um, decided to pop along to the home and sent uh, 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 the, the 10-year-old brother away to the sh local shops to buy some cigarettes for him. While he, while, while Dode, the 10 year old boy was away purchasing these cigarettes, um, uh, Muhammad Abbas, the Muslim perpetrator, raped young Saiba uh, for at least 40 minutes. Uh, the, the, the uh, Dode arrived, the, Dode, the 10 year old brother, arrived around 10 minutes after he'd gone for the cigarettes and had to wait outside for half an hour listening to some strange noises, not knowing what was happening to his sister. All he could hear was her awful screaming uh, and, and, and crying, a, a, a sound in, in which he says uh, expressed her great pain because he'd never heard her, her shriek so, so shrill before. Um, uh, on, on completion of his attack, uh, the Muslim man, Mohammed Abbas, then uh, grabbed the cigarette box, lit a cigarette, smiled, as he left Dowd and walked away. Dowd went into the property, grabbed his sister and hugged her as he waited for his mum and brother to return. And, and what was the initial reaction from the community where this occurred, Wilson? Well, they live in a Christian community, so you can imagine the initial reaction was complete outrage. Um, you know, there would have been some Muslim supporters of, of the family, but there were also the other side of the Muslim supporters who were asking for the family to accept what had happened to young Saiba and accept a bribe. And many of them actually threatened the family. And so for the th uh, first three months um, after the violence, uh, BPCA took uh, Saiba and her mother brother, and brothers into a safe house far, far away from where they lived. Now, now the man convicted of this crime, Wilson, his name is Mom, uh, Muhammad Abbas, uh, he was given a fine and 25 years in prison just recently. So what would have happened to him if he had raped a 14 or 15 year old Christian girl? What would have happened there? It's very hard to say. Obviously, the very fact that this child was extremely young created more outrage than it would have done with a 14 year old. Don't forget, 14 years is the legal consent for marriage. Often in circumstances such as that, the girls would not only be raped, they'd then be kidnapped and forced into Islamic marriage and that the girl will probably have become Mohammed Abbas's wife uh, for a period of longevity, if not forever. Um, because uh, Muslim uh, evidence, uh, or he, his voice of witness, is 10 times stronger than a Christian. So when you go to the courts, when a Muslim says, I'm legally married, it's very hard for Christians to disagree with him. Um, but in this case, obviously, the girl was very young. The outrage was there. And you know, by some miracle, uh, we've managed to get justice for for the family. It's very, very rare for cases like this where a Christian has been attacked for justice to prevail in this fashion. And, and we've heard in the past uh, cases similar to this usually end up in some kind of payment given to the Christian family. Tell us about that. 
Well, under Sharia law, there is a term called kisas and diyat. I won't go into it in too much detail, uh, but it simply is an opportunity for perpetrators of crime to seek um, uh, acquittal um, by paying a bribe in forgiveness of their sins. Uh, it's an awful Islamic law uh, that Pakistan has adopted, uh, and one that unfortunately has allowed many perpetrators to escape justice. But in this particular case, due to the uh, extreme, uh, 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 extremely well-fought case, we've managed to get this justice. And 25 years in prison, um, it, it, it's a long sentence. I mean, I, I know some people are calling for even more severe sentence uh, for, for the nature of this crime, uh, but, but this is very good going. So, so rare justice actually delivered uh, to Pakistani Christians. Why this time? Uh, Wilson, and, and is it a possible trend we're seeing, maybe? Definitely a trigger for this justice would be the um, story of Eliza, the Muslim girl who'd been kidnapped. And I think many, even you know, the, the staunchest Muslims in Pakistan were hurt by that because she was a Muslim girl uh, who was seen walking, you know, walking away with a, a Muslim rapist. But also this, this case was fought very stringently. Evidence that was compiled was submitted very early. The family were taken straight into protection. So, so it's getting to these cases quickly with legal help, assistance, and, uh, and then putting pressure on the government, I'm sure. What can our viewers do then, Wilson, about these crimes against Christian girls? How should we respond as believers? Well, we have to pray. I mean, the figures are you know, devastating. When we talk about 700 Christian girls being kidnapped, raped, and forced into Islamic marriage every year, and that's an estimation by a Muslim NGO. Any Christian NGO will tell you the figures must be in their thousands. Uh, and that's just for Christians. There are also Hindus and Sikhs that would come into that equation. Um, what can we do? I mean, it's, we need to continue putting pressure on the Pakistani government. We, uh, and again, we've got to pay for, for the law and the authorities who enact the laws to change the way they, um, they, uh, they, are, they work in regards to the Christian minority. Already we're seeing some change with uh, Chief Justice Saqib Nasser having set up in Lahore uh, for the Supreme Court a special body that deals with Christian cases, meaning that cases are expedited and taken care of more diligently. It's, it's machinations like that that will help Christians achieve a better, more safe lifestyle in Pakistan. Okay, action and of course prayer and I'm sure our viewers will be praying for a little Saiba. I imagine she's probably close to four now? Yeah, she should be close to four now. Okay. Wilson Chowdhury, we thank you and appreciate you. Thanks for being with us. Now that the summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un is over, what's next? And how should Christians respond? Well, joining us for a summit wrap-up from Singapore is CBN News Asia correspondent Lucille Toulouse. And Lucille... What did you think? A very historic moment. Did it meet all the expectations? Yeah, if we're talking about um, signing an agreement, then uh, expectations were met because before the summit, you know, there were lots of uh, comments that uh, Trump might walk away after just a minute. But yeah, they signed an agreement. But when you look into what is in the agreement, that is... Uh, what analysts are saying that they are kind of disappointed because they say that it's lacking substance, it's lacking details and concrete commitment as to how, you know, this will change the region. Um, and also, but, and also the, uh, a big move or a big decision that uh, Trump made is to stop the military, the joint military exercises in South Korea. I don't know. Uh, I wonder how South Korea and other allies are thinking about that. Do they welcome that decision? So that, I think, are the things that uh, we can look into. And another thing is also the implementation of this agreement, because as analysts say, it's the same, almost the same agreement as what was signed 25 years ago. Um, I also like what uh, Kim Jong-un said, that it's, it's good to leave the past behind. And also what President Trump said that um, he described uh, Kim Jong-un as uh, being very bold uh, because he said it takes courage to abandon all those nuclear weapons and programs and to choose peace. 
Well, you know, he, the president did receive a lot of criticism for pledging to um, you know, discontinue those military exercises with South Korea. Uh, a lot of people said, well, did the South Koreans even know he was going to do that? Uh, but I, I think he, what he's trying to do, Lucille, sounds like he's trying to show goodwill. And yes. what they're not focusing in on is he's not withdrawing 29,000 American troops from the Korean Peninsula. He's not discontinuing or removing the THAAD missile, anti-missile mm -hmm. system that's in place in South Korea. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, I found President Trump's negotiating style very interesting. Uh, he even took yes. Kim Jong-un over to his limo. Yeah. And he, he and showed him what's called the beast. It's referred to as the beast. Why did he do yeah. that? I think it's part of his strategy. He's, he's a veteran when it comes to negotiation. And, it, you know, it's like, actually, when I saw them, when I first saw them, you know, uh, walking towards each other, my heart was pounding. When, But it was like a grandfather saying to his grandchild, hey, you better listen to me, you know, and then, you know, walks to this limo and said, see, you can have this as long as you follow and as long as you open your country to freedom and, and to investments. And um, choosing Singapore as the venue for the summit is also a wise decision because, you know, Kim Jong-un and even the rest of, of his delegate um, delegation can see uh, what a first world country looks like and that they can also have this and enjoy all this um, prosperity if uh, they let investment in and if they demilitarize the country. And may I add, Gary, the, the, very, the most important accomplishment of this summit is um, beginning a good relationship. And I think that alone is already a big accomplishment. Lucille, many Christians were praying for this moment. It started long ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, and what are they praying now? Yeah. Well, as we know, um, Christianity started in Pyongyang in North Korea several years ago. And uh, I believe that all this that is happening now is is a result, is fruit of the prayers of the many North Koreans who have suffered, who, has, who have sacrificed their lives, you know, in defending their faith. And, 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 and I know and I believe that even if, you know, there was no mention of religious freedom in the summit, but I believe that North, North Koreans and the South Koreans, uh, the families of North Korean defectors are very happy. And I, I, I'm sure they are praising God for this development because it is really a big breakthrough. And what will they be praying now? Well, for um, things to move forward. And uh, as they do that, then eventually, um, you know, Kim Jong-un will have a soft, softer heart. You know, my impression of Kim Jong-un when I saw him, um, it, it was like a 180 degree turnabout. It, it's it's very different from how he his image is, you know, being tough and brutal and cruel with all this and crazy and mad, you know, um, loving all these nuclear weapons. I find him a man that, you know, with a soft heart. Somewhere there is a soft heart. Well, and, a lot. Of, I know we're out of time now, Lucille, but a lot of Christians yeah. are praying even for his salvation. Now that President Trump's summit with Kim Jong-un is over, how likely is the president to enjoy a surge in popularity? Will Trump's success on the world stage help him and the Republicans win votes in November? Or will a blue wave of elected Democrats take over Congress? Well, joining us to share some insights is American public opinion pollster and consultant Pat Cadell. Pat, it's been a while, but I know you've been doing this for a long time, going yes, back to I Jimmy have, Carter. Really. How surprised were you by this summit? Well, I was um, surprised that it took place. I mean, a few months ago, uh, you know, we were at, um, uh, in a t very tense situation between us and the North Koreans. You know, then the summit was on, then it was off, and it's back on. You know, I, I watched yesterday and last night. I was actually up late watching summit. You know, I thought it was a historical occasion. Um, you know, we are dealing with a rogue nuclear power. Donald Trump is doing his best to deal with this, and I think it should be encouraged. Then I watch some of the stations on cable and others, and they're attacking this. I mean, it, it dawns on me the old saw, 
If Donald Trump walked on water, their criticism be he couldn't swim. Two months ago, they were screaming, or two weeks, three weeks ago, he was going to get us, you know, back to confrontation. Six months ago, he's going to put us in a war. And he makes, he seems to be making some progress. Sometimes I worry that his political foes, both in the media and politically, um, you know, are rooting against America, which I think is a mistake politically. And the president's ratings, remember, are a key to uh, the outcome of midterms. So this cannot hurt him. I think the American people would like to see this resolved. It would be in the interest of peace, and it would be to everyone's benefit. Well, how likely uh, will this affect his popularity and support? Do you think he'll have well, a big bump out of this, or what will happen? No, I think he'll get some bump. I don't know that we can predict this yet totally in advance. Nothing concrete was necessarily said. But he did make progress on this. He showed himself to be a world leader. And, uh, you know, I just don't see how that hurts, hurts him. So I think he'll get a bump out of this, for sure. The media, um, uh, the CNN, the... Uh, uh, MSNBC, their hatred of Trump, their narrative is so negative that it is taking them, to, uh, the, dragging the Democrats to a place that I don't think they should want to be. And you could see this with the G7 coverage. Oh, my God, you'd have thought Trump had turned the world upside down. I, I just think the American people have had it. They rate the media very low for a reason. And that's because the media has stopped being, Gary, an institution uh, the mainstream media, where people get facts. What they get is political narrative designed on the basis of partisan political beliefs. And to pretend that that's journalism is ridiculous. I've been in this business 50 years. I've never seen anything like it. And I noticed that Jimmy Carter a few months ago said the same thing. No president has been treated the way this one is. And when you treat the president with total disrespect, uh, you know, there, and he reacts to it, it's not going to be pretty. What is the mood of the country? The mood of the country is somewhat better than it's been in recent years. It's still very anti-establishment. The American people, and I have been chronicling this several years before 2016 and into 2016, and said, we're headed for, we're, we're headed, we're in a pre-revolutionary moment. The American people are about to uprise against what they believe in establishment that has failed America. And that's what happened. Despite all of the things that uh, working against Trump, he got elected, and uh, they can't deal with this. They don't ask themselves, what's wrong with us? Well, what's wrong with them is that when 70 percent of the American people believe the country is in decline, you know, getting up and saying how great we're all doing and aren't we great, the establishment and whatever you heard in 16 of the conventions and from the media. It doesn't sell. Well, it doesn't seem that they're going to change tactics any. Uh, but looking ahead, I know it's extremely early. Which type of Democrat is likely to win their party's nomination for president in 2020? And oh, God. do you think Trump will I be reelected? Well, I think at the moment I would put money on Trump because his opposition is so divided. The Democratic Party, the party I'm a member of, uh, is moving so far to the left and so far out of the mainstream. And the candidates are trying to, tr to pardon the pun, trump each other on that. And uh, there is very little room for a, uh, for someone like Jimmy Carter, who was an outsider, um, but uh, a centrist in a very liberal party, and uh, and won an incredible nomination and election in '76. But and, they're, unli uh, they're unlikely but to have someone that, like Carter. No. I, I mean, they're unlikely to have. They probably need a more moderate candidate. Yes. Well, they would be, as the outside party, you think, more open outsiders. They're all insiders. The Democratic Party rigged its rules that way, and even now they're fighting over this. But the instinct is to prove themselves first, uh, uh, which I think is a mistake. I think the disaster for the Democratic Party has been identity politics. Every group is a victim, and you treat every person based on how they look or what they are, rather than a what was the democratic approach, a unifying message in behalf of common people, that unified people. This is all very divisive. It is a party at the moment in the, in the throes of total control by its ideological interest groups, whether that's on abortion or whether that's on, you know, um, gay rights or whatever. There is no moderating overall vision. 
And, 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 and that's the problem. Trump could be very vulnerable, but they are uh, looking at it today. I don't see how they managed to get it together. Well, and without a vision, the people perish, and in this case, exactly. the party I as well. Exactly. I almost said the same thing. Okay, Pat, we're out of time. Uh, Pat Cadell, we've appreciated you for many years. We'll talk to you again. Thank you for being with us. Great. Thank you, Gary. This is primary season across America. Some recent results may give us a clue as to which way the November election may go. Will voters turn against the president and the Republicans? Is a blue wave coming? Well, joining us to provide some political insights is Tom Del Beccaro. He's a radio and TV commentator and author of the book, The Divided Era. Tom, thanks for joining us. So were there any surprises from the recent primaries, I'm thinking especially in California? Well, if you look at what happened in California, you might really kind of say what didn't happen. You know, for months, the media really is dating back to December has told us a blue wave was coming and there was polling mainly media polling that showed a big gap in the congressional generic poll. Would you rather vote for a Republican or a Democrat in the fall? Some as high as 18 points saying the Democrats were going to have this blue wave. But of course, recent polls have showed it virtually tied. And then you had the California primaries. Now, California of any place on earth should have been the blue wave place, right? This is the center of the resistance to Trump. They've filed 32, 33 whatever the last count, lawsuits against them. You have what they said would be an angry Latino vote, and they were concentrating, Nancy Pelosi at all, were concentrating on seven seats that Hillary won, congressional districts, that Hillary won that they said they'd be able to flip. Well, what happened on Tuesday was six of those seven seats, the Republicans won the majority of the vote. Not only that, the Republicans recalled a sitting state Democrat senator and replaced him with a Republican. And so the big splash, the big wave didn't happen here. In fact, they had two statewide famous Latino candidates who did really poorly. The Latino vote didn't come out in droves. So if the Democrats in D.C. are looking to California as ground zero for their resistance and their blue wave, they're very disappointed this week. Across the country, a Republican turnout actually is up, is it not? Yes. So what, it, what happened in California is not good news for them. And part of it relates to the inevitability that Diane would win and the inevitability that Gavin Newsom would be the next governor. And therefore, a lot of Democrats aren't coming out. They don't really have that intense motivation that the major media has been claiming. The Republicans, on the other hand, have the repeal of the gas tax, which is what they use to recall that state senator, and they have their anti-anti-resistance, which matters in those seven districts. And so motivationally, in California, the Democrats don't have a big edge, even though they have a huge edge in voter registration, 44% to 25%. Blue wave, red wave, something in between. What are what can we expect? I think the Republicans actually could well pick up some Senate seats. There's a lot of seats, I think six seats, where Trump won that state by 20 points. And the economy is going to be doing so well by the fall. And if this North Korea thing comes off. So I think that, that they'll pick up Senate seats. They will lose House seats here and there. They may lose five or six uh, by, the, by Election Day. That's a normal dynamic but they're not going to lose the House. And it seems voters always vote pocketbook, do they not? Well, usually, unless foreign policy takes over or an incredible scandal like you saw with Watergate. But remember, the next month is going to be dominated by the DOJ report saying how bad the Obama administration was. So that works in their favor. Okay. So I don't lose in the House. Well, long, hot summer ahead, I think. So Tom Del Beccaro, thanks so much for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me on. Last month, comedian Samantha Bee used a vulgar slur to describe President Trump's daughter, Ivanka. And more recently, at the Tony Awards, actor Robert De Niro went after the president himself. Trump. It's no longer down with Trump, it's Trump. Many of those in attendance stood and applauded. The president responded, saying De Niro must have taken too many hits to the head. 
wake up, punchy, he tweeted. Have you ever seen such hate and juvenile comments from Hollywood? I'm not defending Roseanne Barr for her stupid remarks about Valerie Jarrett. That cost her a popular TV show and millions of dollars. However, Samantha Bee didn't lose her show for her vulgar description of Ivanka Trump. Like Roseanne, she later apologized, so I guess it's not okay to make a slur against a former Obama administration official, but all right to make vulgar and hateful remarks against the president and his family members. I'm not condoning any of these slurs from Hollywood, but I think there's a bit of a double standard here. And folks, the hits just keep on coming. There's more outrage from the entertainment industry, this time from Netflix, and it's about superheroes. You know, kids love superheroes, don't they? When I was a young boy, I loved watching Superman on TV. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman. Strange. Remember that one? As I got a bit older, it was Batman. No, Robin. No. It's not for mortals like us to tamper with the laws of nature. Today, the Avengers enjoy box office success and... Now Netflix says it's going to premiere a new superhero show, this one called Super Drags. The video streaming service tweeted, they're here, they're queer, and they're going to save the world. Super Drags, a new animated series coming soon. The synopsis reads, by night they tighten up their corsets and transform into the baddest super drags in town, ready to combat shade and rescue the world's glitter from the evil villains. I can't understand Netflix's thinking on this, can you? They must know that children will be attracted to this animated show. Either Netflix is trying to influence young, impressionable minds and advance an agenda, or add subscribers from the LGBT community. Regardless, many conservatives are disgusted and even outraged. Netflix will lose subscribers over this, probably more than they will gain. And whether the outrage comes from actors, comedians, or video entertainment, in America, they're free to say and produce whatever they like. But that doesn't mean we have to listen or watch. Consumer boycotts have hurt companies like Target and the NFL, and it seems they only understand the outrage when it hits them in the pocketbook. Hollywood and all of us could take a little bit of advice from Philippians 4.8. Think about these things. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything that is excellent and praiseworthy. So let's demand more purity and excellence, not only from Hollywood, in their productions and in their speech, but also in our own lives and actions. Well, that's it from The Global Lane. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Twitter. And until next time, be blessed.